Hi everybody, and welcome to POCUS Cases. This screencast series will look at where point-of-care ultrasound was helpful in patient care. In this case, a 60-year-old female presents to the emergency department with a chief complaint of shortness of breath. Her past medical conditions are significant for breast cancer, which was treated with chemotherapy, with her last chemo being one month ago, and COPD, where she's on two different puffers, a blue puffer and an orange puffer. A closer look at her vitals show that her temperature is 36.8, her heart rate's 120, her respirate's 23, and her oxygen saturation is low at 82% on room air, but with six liters, she's at 94%, and her blood pressure is 120 over 89. On history, she has shortness of breath that's been severe over the last three days, it occurs with limited exertion and at rest. There's been no cough at any time, no chest pain, no fevers, and no leg swelling. She's had literal to no relief with her puffers. On physical exam, she has normal heart sounds, no murmur, wheezes bilaterally. Her abdomen's soft and non-tender. There's no leg edema or calf tenderness. Of all the features here on history and physical, the one that stands out to me is the wheezes bilaterally. That might help determine what the diagnosis is. Working through the case, my resident indicated this is probably a COPD exacerbation. He wants to treat with back-to-back -back salbutamol and atrovent masks, as well as steroids. Interestingly, he indicates that there's also a can't-miss diagnosis, and he refers to pulmonary embolism as something else that he would want to rule out in this case. Here's an interesting journal article. It's titled Wheezing in Patients with Acute Pulmonary Embolism with and Without Previous Cardiopulmonary Disease. It shows that wheezing is a little known but possible presentation of acute pulmonary embolism. It looked at 154 consecutive patients with acute PE and the results showed that 14 patients with acute pulmonary embolism had wheezing at presentation. They concluded that wheezing in acute pulmonary embolism may be more frequent in patients with cardiopulmonary disease. Wheezing can be a sign of severity in acute pulmonary embolism. So what are our options in this case? We can treat as a COPD exacerbation and gauge the outcome. We can do a chest x-ray to see if there's an alternative diagnosis in this case. A D-dimer to find out if it's elevated to pull the trigger to do a CT scan or use our point-of-care ultrasound to help distinguish the two diagnoses. In this case, we decided to go with the latter, and here are the images that we generated. Before we go into the actual patient's image, I just want to point out the anatomy of what normal looks like. This is a normal anatomy for a parasternal lung. In this case, we have the left ventricle here, the left atrium here, and here's the mitral valve in between the two. Here's the aortic outflow tract, and this chamber here is the right ventricle. This is the interventricular septum. When we compare the parasternal longs of what normal looks like to our patient's parasternal long, I'll start by playing the normal video that we saw on the previous slide. And this is our patient's parasternal long in the case that we are presenting. One of the things that I would like to point out is that the right ventricle in this video of our patient is quite large compared to the normal size video. Also, you can tell how tachycardic our patient is by looking at how fast the heart's beating. This is what a normal anatomy of a parasternal short looks like. This here is the right ventricle chamber. This is the left ventricle chamber. Notice how when the left ventricle beats, it gets smaller and bigger. It's almost like a donut shrinking and growing. Here's a side-by-side -side view of the personal short. That's normal. And this is our patient's personal short. Once again, one thing that jumps out at you is how big the right ventricle is compared to the left ventricle. Finally, here's the normal anatomy of an apical four-chamber view. This is the left ventricle. This is the left atrium. Here is the mitral valve. This is the right atrium, and this is the right ventricle. Now playing them side by side, 
This is the same video as on the last screen where they display normal anatomy. And here's our patient's apical four chamber. And once again, notice how dilated the right ventricle is compared to the left ventricle in this view compared to normal. So a lot of you at home are probably saying, so doesn't this confirm a PE? The right ventricle is bigger than the left ventricle. Well, not exactly, at least not in this case. This case is a little bit more complicated because of the previous core morbidities that this patient had. If I was presenting a case of a 20 year old, previously healthy, who has PE risk factors such as just started an oral contraceptive pill, comes in tachycardic with pleuritic chest pain, and you get these images, then it's a slam dunk. It's obviously a PE in that case. But in this case, it's a little bit more complicated. What we've shown in these, in these videos of the patient is that this patient has right ventricular heart strain. And there's a differential diagnosis to that. One thing it could be is pulmonary hypertension. Maybe it's mitral stenosis. As we think in this case, it could be a pulmonary embolism. Any chronic lung disease that causes core pulmonale can cause right ventricular heart strain. Any of your congenital heart diseases can do it as well. ARVD is another thing that can cause right ventricular heart strain. When we talk about pulmonary embolism on a bedside ultrasound, there are common findings that we look for. Here's a list of common findings of PE on bedside ultrasound. First, we look at the RV to LV ratio. Is your right ventricle dilated compared to your left ventricle? If that's the case, that could be a point towards being a PE. Is there a D sign present? Is there a TAPSI, which is tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion? Is there a McConnell sign? It should be noted that even though we think about these as findings for PE, they're all also found in chronic pulmonary hypertension. Let's go through each of the signs and what they look like on your bedside ultrasound. First, let's talk about RV to LV ratio. Here's a video of our patient. As we shown when we looked at the normal anatomy, this is your left ventricle, this is your left atrium, this is your right atrium, and this is your right ventricle. Notice that the size of the left ventricle and the size of the right ventricle are quite different. In this case, the right ventricle is more dilated compared to the left ventricle. Here's a view of a parasinal short. This is showing what D sign looks like. D sign occurs when the right ventricle has such high pressures that it pushes the interventricular septum into the left ventricle. The left ventricle, instead of being that circular donut, looks like the letter D. Here's a comparison of a normal left ventricle on a parasinal short, where it's nice and circular, getting bigger and smaller. And here's our patient's parasinal short view. As you can see, the letter D is being made when the heart beats. Next, we'll talk about TAPSI or tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. This is another measurement that can help you in determining one of the findings for acute PE. The way to do it is to use M mode. As you can see, as time goes by, you can detect the movements of the objects that that line is on. In this case, we have the line over the lateral annulus by doing so, we can measure its motion, and you can see that the lateral annulus is moving up and down. For TAPSI, we can measure the systolic excursion, and in this case, when we measure it, we are getting a value of 14.59 millimeters. Now, I find everyone I ask has a different value for TAPSI. Some people use 18 millimeters, and some people use very specific numbers, like 20.1 millimeters. Regardless, in this case, our number of 14.59 is less than both of these numbers. This informs us that there's definitely some dysfunction of the right ventricle and points us in the direction that this may be a PE. Another sign that you can use to point towards PE is one of the more specific signs, and that's McConnell sign. McConnell sign is when there is limited movement of the free wall of the right ventricle but there's apical sparing, meaning that the apex is gonna look like it's moving quite a bit compared to the rest of the right ventricle. When I play this video,
you'll see that the right ventricle wall barely moves. But if you look at where the apex is, the apex looks like it's bouncing up and down compared to how much the rest of the ventricle is moving. Let's compare that side by side now with normal and one with our patients. So this is normal where the entire right ventricle wall seems to be moving symmetrically. Each part of the wall moves in and out about the same amount. In our patient, it appears that the apex is moving up and down a lot more than the right ventricle free wall. In fact, the right ventricle free wall is barely moving in and out at all, but the apex is moving up and down. This is a positive McConnell sign in this case. This study tried to look for very specific findings that you can use for a QPE. And what it showed is that although positive McConnell sign were seen quite frequently in a QPE, it was also seen in some cases of chronic pulmonary hypertension. So although a very useful sign to help distinguish if a PE is present, it's not perfect. In fact, when this study looked at all of the features that might help in terms of which are most specific for PE, it found that right ventricular outflow tract systolic excursion was one of the most specific findings. In fact, when present, it most likely points towards PE. And if you plug your values into this complicated looking formula, you can actually measure the right ventricular outflow tract systolic excursion. And although this formula looks quite complicated, it's not actually complicated at all. So let's take a look at measuring right ventricle outflow tract excursion. This is a video of a patient who does not have a pulmonary embolism. In this video, as you can see, we are in the parasternal short axis view, and we are at the level of the aortic valve. Point your eyes to this here. This here is the right ventricle, and this is the free wall of the right ventricle. And as you see, as the heart contracts, it gets closer to the valve. We can measure this distance between the valve by using M mode. This is how you measure right ventricular outflow tract systolic excursion. Here is the right ventricle free wall, and here is the aortic valve. And you'll notice here, you can measure the distance where they're closest together and the distance they're furthest apart, and you can obtain values. If you plug them into the formula, as seen in the article, you can measure right ventricle outflow tract systolic excursion. In the article, it showed that if you have severe chronic pulmonary hypertension, the values they were receiving on average were approximately 31. However, if you had acute pulmonary embolism, the number was quite lower, closer to 17. In our case, where our patient had an acute pulmonary embolism, the right ventricle outflow tract excursion was quite low, indicating that in this case, it was a PE. So based on these POCUS findings, puffers and steroids were not started. The patient was expedited for CT scan to confirm a PE. Heparin was started, and a discussion of goals of care with the patient were had, and lytics were at the bedside in case the patient were to have a cardiac arrest. So what happened when we took this patient to the CT scanner? Well, unfortunately she was diagnosed with a large blood clot and right ventricular heart strain was seen. And if you're sitting there at home and saying, wow, that's a pretty big arrow pointing out that blood clot, I just wanted to make sure everyone can see it because, well, I use a Blackberry phone and a PC and I was just making sure that it looked clear that that's what the finding was. So here's a few summary and pearls regarding this case. First, wheezes do not always mean that there's an asthma or COPD exacerbation. And just remember that approximately 10% of acute PEs present with a wheeze, and that wheezing in patients with PEs might be a sign of severity. Shortness of breath is one of the chief complaints where POCUS can really be used to distinguish what the diagnosis is and get your answer faster right at the bedside without having a patient have to leave the emergency department to get a diagnosis. Finally, POCUS can help distinguish acute PE versus chronic conditions of right ventricular heart strain. Findings such as McConnell sign, D sign, TAPSI are all quite good. However, they're not as specific as right, right ventricle outflow tract excursion on POCUS, which is a very specific sign that the patient has an acute pulmonary embolism. One last word of caution.
This is just a disclaimer to ensure everyone remains safe when trying to diagnose PE with ultrasound. Just as a reminder, a normal POCUS does not mean that there's no PE. POCUS can only detect pulmonary embolisms that cause right ventricular strain. Many patients can have PE that have no right ventricular strain. Only massive and submassive PEs tend to have right ventricular strain. Thus, POCUS is specific for PE, but POCUS has a very poor sensitivity for PE. So just remember, you can have a completely normal ultrasound and the patient may have a PE. The ones that we're more worried about in the emergency department, however, are the PEs that have right ventricular heart strain that can cause the patient to have a cardiac arrest. These ones are generally picked up on ultrasound as we can see the changes in the heart caused by the pulmonary embolism. People ask me, Rob, what resources are you using to do your point of care ultrasounds? And I'd like to point them to this book, The Essentials of Point of Care Ultrasound by Sokransky and Wiss. This was the resource I was using when I was learning how to do bedside ultrasound. And it's very easy to follow with very uh, detailed steps on how to perform bedside ultrasound. I always like to give a shout out to the people that helped me out. And in this image, you'll meet Puneet Kapoor. Puneet Kapoor was the resident that was on with me the day that we saw this case. Uh, Puneet was doing his fellowship with us, and during his fellowship, he came across this patient, and he generated the images that you saw in this video today. If you have any questions that are POCUS related, please email me at pocuscases at gmail.com. I'll endeavor to answer your questions, and I hope to post more videos like this in the very near future.